Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Ronan Nazarin Talks. I'm Solitary Ronan from Solitary Ronan Films. And I'm Nazarin Ford from Nazarin Ford Films. <laughs> yes, we've, we've, we've had a bit of a break, um, but we've decided to come back with our review of what we watched in 2022. Unfortunately, yeah. this is now like almost the middle of 2023, but life gets in the way of film watching sometimes. It's ridiculous. Life ought to be told. but Yeah. Yeah, as you probably guess from our own channels, there's been gaps. Uh, neither of us had a had a particularly great uh, end of the year, so no. so um, life's got in the way, and uh, we're still kind of slowly coming back to normal again. I think is the best way to put it. Yeah, so this isn't going to be anything structured. This is just going to be a lot of nonsense, which is obviously completely different from our usual episodes. Yes. Which are highly constructed, and yeah, yeah. We spend months writing it, and you know, yeah, yeah. We plan to actually have other people on initially before everything went wrong, and then by the time we actually get around to doing this, it was a month that never everyone done their videos, and I was like, Well, what's the point? <laughs> we really want to yes. do hours, and yeah, so this idea we had for a while was just how we did it last year was basically what we watched is not released in 2022, that actually because we both watched stuff. Not tied to the year more than watching stuff tied to the year. It's in some ways it's more of our genuine 2022 list than the actual releases of the year. Yeah, I mean, I think I watched about five films that were actually made in 2022 last year. So it'd be a short video for me. So yes, I've watched more, but to be honest, most of the ones I'll end up watching. From last year, I'll probably not watch over the next few years, and then eventually I was like, "It's just the way it goes." I just don't, I don't have the energy to keep on try to keep up, catch up, and it's like, yeah, I want to watch when I want to watch it. I don't care enough. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know. I think you might have some rewatches in your list, but for me, these are the films that I watched for the first time in twenty twenty two that really impressed me. I mean, there's a couple of exceptions, but that's just because they actually got Blu-ray releases for the first time. So. Yep. And we should point out in 2023, you've gone 4K, finally. Yes, I've got a video up. I went 4K, so I had 4Ks that I'd bought just as part of special editions of Flash Gordon because I just had to. Um, but I have since I went 4K last week, I've uh, bought a few some have uh, come in and I've watched them, and others will probably be coming in this week. But we're all going to go mad. Um, yeah, yeah. I was pointing out to you before this it was basically the difference between you and me. When I went in 4K, there was absolutely nothing. Basically, we would Kubrick stuff and uh, and the Elephant Man, and that was pretty much it. And a couple other ones in the Studio Canal, and that was pretty much it. There wasn't much. So a lot of my earlier trashier films in 4K came from the initial splodge. 4K, yes. So, and you've got actually you've got more titles you actually can buy. Yes, um, it's actually not a bad time to actually go big 4K. So, because it's actually obviously indicator released their or announced their first 4K releases. Um, and some, I mean, one of the reasons for getting it is once upon a time the West is coming out, three colors blue, three colors blue, three colors trilogy is coming out. Um, yesterday I found out Midnight Runs getting a 4K. So. Yep. The Dollars trilogy is out already. Yeah, I've ordered two out of three. I've I've got two and I've got the third one on, on order and it's on the post. So yeah. so which two have you ordered? Uh number two and number three. Right. That's two I've got. I think generally they're, they're the better ones and the third first one is I've also had the first one the, the weakest transfer because of the materials they had. Yeah. So I left it until last, but now I've got that. But uh you know, so I'll be focusing on like Lynch and Cronenberg. I've ordered Crash and Videodrome. Um, already had one of the films we'll maybe talk about. So, yeah, it'll be specific directors. I'll kind of try and yeah. get. Obviously, I picked up the Kubrick Five film set for yeah. half price because the box is torn, but it's like it's like so, half price. So, so, so what's in that five? It's uh, Spartacus, 2001, The Shining, 
a full metal jacket and the one that I always forget. Clockwork Orange? Clockwork Orange, that's one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, the ones that tend, they're the ones that were out earliest, so that's why I was guessing it would be them, because yeah. those were the five, and then there's other ones that pass over that come out, and that's a very yeah. good transfer. But yeah, they're very but, good transfers, all the Kubrick ones, even Spartacus, which is not a film I like very much, still yeah. a very nice transfer. Not me either. Um, usually it's 70 odd quid, but I got it for 40 because, like I said, there's a rip in the box. It's like, okay, yeah. I'll take that for half price. So. Yeah, I do that as well. I always like there's a rip somewhere. So I'm, yeah. I'm on it for the discs, so I don't care. Uh, We're looking forward to 2001. Yeah, it's a very nice transfer. Uh, so we should get started on our list then. Yes. Um, who wants to go first? I mean, like I say, mine will just be rambling. Um, but certainly one of the box sets I enjoyed was Universal Noir 1 um, nice. by Indicator and certainly The Web um, and Kiss the Blood Off My Hands, which is a great title. Kiss the Blood Off My, Blood Off My Hands with Burt Lancaster in London. Um, there's certainly two highlights from that box set, but another wonderful noir box set from Indicator. Yeah, I've got that one, but and I've got the Columbia ones, but I, I just haven't started watching some of other things I've been watching. It's like, yeah. since that thing is, with noirs, I know once I hit a noir phase, I'll just go through them all. So, yeah, they're so, just so watchable because they're generally all under 90 minutes and they just like whiz by. So, yeah. So, uh, my first choice actually is not a film at all. Wow. It's not even a TV show. What? It's a press conference. Press conference? It was so good, though. It was so amazingly good that I've watched it quite a few times. Now, you have to be a wrestling fan to know about this one at all. Right. Um, so it's a CM Punk press scrum where he absolutely murdered his own bosses. Some of his co-workers for being, in, being incompetent and unprofessional. It was one of those, that great thing of now, if you're dealing with people who you think in your life are absolute tubes and are bring your job into disrespect. And this is professional wrestling where, yeah. you know, it's, we all know what professional wrestling is, but if he just ripped into them in a way, it was like, uh, what the hell he's doing? And it was such a, it was so well delivered. It was like, I've been waiting to see this for years. This is just so good. This is, this is like the, if you ever want to quit your job, this is how you do it. <laughs> this is like, it was wonderful. I watched it again last week and it's just so good. Plus he's eating muffins the whole way through it all as he just tears into them and tears into the fact that they're, some of these people are unprofessional and uh, do not learn from people with experience. And it was like, oh, it was just wonderful. It's, uh... it and it's, it's a... It's one of those things, they still talk about it six months afterwards, a lot. That's how big it was. That's how, like, wonderful. And after after this, the him and three or four others who he slagged off got into a fight backstage, and they all get suspended. It was just, you couldn't top it for yeah. everything being wonderful. It was like, so this had to go on my list, even though it's not a film or TV show, but it was like, it's hard to think of anything this year that was as dramatic and as crazy as that. So that's why it's yeah. in. <laughs> Sums up twenty twenty two. Yeah, it was. It, it was. It was my great experience twenty twenty two. Actually, it was just for like, wow. I've always wanted to see something. You know, normally when people get fed up with others, they don't. There's only so far they'll go. Now he went in both feet. You know. Yes. So. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my. I, I recommend anyone to watch it who's watching this. It's it's something else. Is that available on YouTube or? Is oh yes, on YouTube. YouTube. If you want the link, I'll, I'll send you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wonderful. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'll let you go to the next choice before I rant about this again. <laughs> um, I was to a recent uh, release by. Eureka, it's animation, it's Son of the White Mare um, from Hungary, a friend of the channel, Chris Mohan, talked about this in one of his watch lists. 
Um, just beautiful animation. There's um, extra short animations included in the set. It's just a really nice set. Um, and just beautiful uh, artwork as well. Um, and just lovely animation. Um, just quite a beautiful little set. I think I was released in November, December, something like that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's telling that you've got all your boxes side, you know, I have none. Yeah, I looked them all out. So. Yeah, it was like, yeah. I, I, thought, like I thought I cannot be bothered looking all these out. There's too many. <laughs> yeah, pulling yeah. them out is fun. Putting them all back in again is not yeah. much fun. I, yeah, I don't have that one yet, but it's on my to-do list. It's one of those ones that's like, when it came out uh, late last year, I was skint and I was like, well, I'll get it yeah. down the line. It's just it's one of those ones... Like the last uh, Eureka like uh, box set of horror movies, it's like I will get it. It's just not quite yet. There's something actually quite therapeutic about watching it. It's it's really quite lovely. Yeah. Well, my next choice is actually animation as well, but it's it's a lot more epic. It's uh, Star Blazers, twenty one ninety nine and twenty two oh two, two different TV shows. Um, one's a sequel to the other. Or you could call it Space Battleship Yamato as well. Is that a name for it? It's, it's a remake of the Japanese one from the 70s. And it's this old spaceship, all this old uh, battleship, the World War II song, they bring it back up and it's turned into a spaceship and it's sent as a thing to save humanity to get information from this other place, another side of the galaxy. Which sounds ridiculous, but it's the actual image of this. Um, battleship from World War Two. It's just wonderful because it's so retro amidst all these aliens are fighting and things like that. And it's an episode that shows it's a journey to get to the other place and what the characters do within that story. And then the sequels about the repercussions of that journey. So it's it's not perfect, but it is a wonderful show. I watched both of them really quickly. They've got like twenty six episodes each day. I just stormed through them. And even though there's some more highbrow films on my thing, this was one of the most fun things I had. I'd, I'd watched. Now, this was my last. This is, last January, this was my January, pretty much watching, obsessed with watching these because they were just so much fun. Yeah, I've still to pick those ones up, but they're on my list. Yeah, they're they're really worth it. They're, you know, the character stuff is good, and the just the imagery, just the weird imagery of the old fashioned. And the more modern, it just really works quite nicely. Yep. Um, I'm just going to go with two Criterions. Uh, right. So Ride the Pink Horse, which was directed and starring Robert Montgomery, which is... That title is... I know. <laughs> that title is... It, it's a noir set in Mexico, but a, a guy who goes down to Mexico, it's really strange, really odd. Obviously, it's directed by an actor, but it's it's actually quite fascinating. I did a random review of that. Not, I'm just doing all the things I did a random review of. And Jubal, which is a wonderful little Western with Glenn Ford, um, a Delmore Dave's film um, who did 310 to Humor. Um, this yeah. is better than 310 to Humor because Rod Steiger's in it, um, giving um, another subtle performance. Um, it's just an interesting little psychological Western those wonderful things that they did in the 50s with Westerns. Um, so those two are well worth checking out. Cool. Uh, my next one is Shawscope Volume 1, which came out the year before, but I didn't really watch them all till last year. And it's like, um, they were just great. And I've now got Shawscope Volume 2, which I'm now going through. Uh, it's just a great box set. I mean, it's just wonderful to sit back and watch these like kung fu films made by people who knew what they were doing from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, you, you got a couple of uh, really bizarre ones too, like the Mighty Peking Man, which was a monster movie, and the midst of this box yeah. set. But you also get these great action movies, action kung fu movies that are wonderfully done. They've got a very set style, and they actually... Uh, one of the directors is so, so consistently in his interests that it's like, oh, this guy's almost an auteur within uh, Shaw Brothers because he's so... It's Lea Kuhn Ling or something. I'm, I'm butchering the name. But he he did... He was a guy who was 
Um, the fight organizer for a while, and then he became a director. And his his films are just wonderful. Every time he's involved, one is always just worth watching. Cause it's so good, and they're just great fun films. They're tacky in lots of ways, but that's part of the enjoyment of them. You know, yeah. I mean, that box set is really special, and um, because of life, I haven't even started volume two yet. Um, but I will at some point this year, um, but I still haven't got around to Volume 2, but Volume 1 was spectacularly good. I think the worst film on it was still good and enjoyable, so that's kind of the standard of them. Yep. Um, I'll go to Indicator in a very strange film, um, Blockhouse, with Peter Sellers um, and others. Um, It's strange because it's it's based on a true story about what happened to some soldiers who were locked in a bunker. I won't give away how long they were locked in there um, in World War II. Um, and obviously their behaviour changed. They came into this bunker, there's food, there's alcohol, um, there's a seemingly endless supply of candles, even though that supply ends. Um, it's a film that they shot on location and it is one of the darkest, and I don't mean in tone, well, it is dark in tone, but it's one of the darkest films you will attempt to see. Um, the sound isn't great. I even had to put subtitles on. I think that's a common experience from everybody who's seen it. But it is just fascinating, even though you'll almost strain your eyes as much as the characters. Um, I can never imagine what it'd be like in DVD, but because the Blu-ray is um, so, so, an interesting so was it an be a sales film. Um, it's seventy three. It's an old wow. one. Wow. Um, and again, the director Clive Rees had to you know, rein him in a bit. And um, Peter Vaughn's in it. And um, Charles Azanor, Leon Lissek. I mean, people that you'd know. Yeah. Um, and as it's almost like one of those human experiments, if you like. Well, let's put these people in a bunker for a period of time and see what happens. And the kind of when we find out what actually happened to the real people that are involved, it is quite upsetting. It's um, wow, but it's one of those films that's really hard to see, but you kind of get into that style of it in their place essentially. Yeah, and um, it's really disturbing and interesting. The extras are wonderful, as always. When you can, cool. My next one is actually something that uh, SJS Arts recommended for years to me. I finally got around to watch it's Possession. Um, it's about Johnny and Sam Neill. Uh, this is one weird film. I've done a video on it. It's a very weird film. I've had it for years, and it's always one of those films I've always said, I'll watch it soon, I'll watch it soon. And eventually this year, or last year, I got around to watch it, and it was like, I should watch this sooner. This is amazing. This is just bizarre. Bizarre in a good way, in the sense is everything feels like it means something. You might not know what it means, but it feels like it means. It feels like the whole film is connected together, even if you might not understand it all. It's one of those films, you, like Cronenberg, where you know everything's in the right place. It's just you try to understand it yourself rather than, you know, ask them to give you the dummy version of it of the story. And you've you've got like actors really going for it, just been really extreme and really like bizarre and not really caring about um, their image because they're just doing these strange, strange performances, which was just wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I watched it last year for the first time, but it didn't make the list because I thought it was um, a good film, but I wasn't blown away by it, to be honest. But I did finally watch it as well. Yep. But different horses for different courses. Yep. Um, I'm going to do a second run film. Usually these are Hungarian or Czech. Um, but this one's Australian. This is Celia. I love the little story about a girl and a rabbit. Um, it crosses a line between fantasy and reality. And it really gives a nice kind of children's view of the adult world. Um adultery and disease and death um, but it's <laughs> that fun shot, stuff <laughs> yeah it's shot in that wonderful australian sunshine um 
but it's a lovely little film. So that's Celia, and I would recommend you pick that up. Yeah, cool. Right, I'm going to now go to um, Danger Diabolique, the Mario Bava film. That it's just wonderful. This is um, my my favorite retro film. I think from last year because it was just so bizarre and so wonderful. It's like this is like. Uh, this is my Baba tried to do a comic book adaptation and taking it literally but doing it right. This is the kind of thing that when they try and be faithful, this is what they try and do and always fail, but this film actually succeeds because yeah. the characters are as simplistic as you think they are and they just focus on the style and focus on the momentum and the pace. So, so the plot has like what would be enough for three films in one, but it all just works perfectly. And you're really enjoying just watching this insane film, this pulp film, delivering exactly what you want from a pulp film. So this is Mario Bava and his element, and it's it's just wonderful. It's so it's such a nice little throwback and show you what you really how you really do these films. And I've got to say, I don't think any Marvel film in the last four ever really has come near this crazy, wonderful film. This is just because no, it doesn't take itself seriously, it's in the spirit of it. So, yeah, it's a shame it didn't get sequels because it's well, there has been recent versions of it coming out, but I haven't seen them yet. But, uh, yeah, like sequels by Bava, that would be I know because the ending's fantastic and set yeah. up well for yeah. yeah. I think I saw that for the first time last year because it was out in imprint, yeah. And, and there's a Beastie Boys uh, video that uh, plays tribute yeah. to that is on, on the actual imprint thing, and it's wonderful because. They obviously love this film, and it's like they put themselves within the film and scenes in the film, and even when there's scenes not in the film, they ate the style of it so much, and it's just like a love letter to this film. So it's great as well within on the disc. So it's yeah. just wonderful. And you have John Philip Law, who is also Sinbad, the best Sinbad movie from Harryhausen, and his other great part. Yes, that's a lot of fun, and it looks absolutely. Stunning. Yep. And um, well, to follow on from that, um, I'm going to pick a Claude Chabrol, but not one of his usual ones. It's one of his admitted failures, the um, Blue Panther, but it's absolutely fantastic. It's Chabrol doing a Bond film, um, but doing it um, completely insanely. Um, Akim Tamarov is the villain. This gets to Fauna Dran. No surprise with Shabrol. Um, it's just absolutely wonderful. So many little wacky details. Um, again, it was a failure, but it's just so much fun. Um, and yeah. if you're into Shabrol, it's something different. But I think yeah. time has been kinder to it than it was in release. Yeah, sometimes people's failures are, uh, filmmakers' failures are one of the more, are the more interesting films. It's the things that you actually can go back to and see. It doesn't always entirely work, but there's, there's so much in there. You know, as I always yeah. love directors' big failures because a lot of the time you can see a lot of them in there. It's just like they haven't quite balanced it out. Yeah, and a lot of the time, sometimes directors who aren't perhaps biggest fans of that genre, they just go for it and just do things that, you know, people who are actually into that genre wouldn't do. Yeah. Um, and it actually makes it better for it. Like, obviously, Mike Hodges, for example, yeah. Flash Gordon, he wasn't into science fiction, he didn't like fantasy, but he just made this. Yeah. Oh, I think it's a masterpiece, but. Yeah, he just went for it completely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My next uh, film is actually, it's sort of an experience of watching a film I'd seen already, but it's who I was watching it with was a big thing. So it was watching Zoo Warriors on the Magic Mountain with my nephew. On a projector, um, and showing him that and watching his brain slowly break, I thought I destroyed his sanity by the end of it. Because this is a film that anyone's seen it jumps around a lot, and the plotting is threadbare to say the least. Like it makes massive plot jumps for ways you don't quite understand. Usually, and it's probably the best watch when you're drunk. It's the best way to put it. So, so I showed this to my nephew who was like 12 at the time and I think, I think I broke his brain for a good half a day 
I don't know if you'd process how this weird film, how it was, yes. what the hell was going on in it, and it was just wonderful to just watch his face get. What, what, what I kept on saying, yeah, you think this is crazy, but, but the next bit is going to be even crazier. And it goes, there's no way. And then the next bit, we're getting crazy. And they'd be like, how the hell did they do that? And then I was like, the last act's even crazy. And he goes, there's no way. And then the last act came out, and it was like, oh my God, you're right. It was wonderful, which is a great experience of a crazy yeah. film. It's like showing people like Hard Boiled or The Killer who've never seen a proper John Woo film before. Yeah. <laughs> and you say to them, do you want to keep count of the body count? And they go, okay. And then after five minutes, you just give up. Yep. Well, in contrast to that, I think this is a film that you saw first and did a video of um, first, um, Hiroshima. Oh, yes. Um, just another one of those beautiful, horrible films. Um, obviously, no guesses to what it's about, but it's just absolutely brutal and absolutely wonderful and should be shown more yeah. often in places. Yeah, it's really haunting. Especially like the fact that they had it was during it plus after it. So you yeah. got to see the, the after effects of it, which makes it much more brutal. I've, yeah. I've, yet, I've yet to watch Black Rain, which is about that as well. I've yet yeah. to watch I've got it, I haven't watched it yet, but it's I think like, Hiroshima stories you have to watch in the right mood. Yeah, I mean, it's not like somebody making a film about it now. You know, this is a lot more immediate yeah. and a lot closer to it, which makes it even um, more harrowing. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I've got... Uh, this is a... You say great horror fan. This is like a great bad... These are two films I watched this year that were absolutely awful. But I enjoyed them so much. And they're both recent releases from this year. But I cannot not mention them. Because I I will over time how bad they were, how bad shit crazy they were. So it was just fun. Which was Moonfall and Carter. Now Moonfall was a Roland Emmerich film with this one, the moon is actually an alien spacecraft and it's yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> and, and, that, and, and that's not the, the most insane part of it. It's 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 astonishing in all the wrong ways. But I'd have to watch it again anytime because it's so it's so stupid that your jaws on the floor every like there hasn't been a film this dumb since Geostorm. And there's a kind of that kind of level of oh my god, I can't believe they're going for it. Oh my god, yeah. this is just stupid as hell. I can't. I love one of every second of it. Um, and there's Encarta's a, a, a Asian film that is like every cliche you could possibly think of from into one film. Like I'm, a spy who's lost his memory, trying to figure it out. Zombies. Everything thrown into this film. If it starts at 100 miles an hour and keeps on going, it's completely moronic. I loved every second of it. Yeah, I've still to check those two out. Yeah, that, that the they were just so much fun to watch. Films this stupid, it was just it was, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Sometimes you're just in the mood for that. So. Yeah, okay, to well, your choice. Um, I'm going to pick another Italian film. Um, as you may or may not know, my Italian cinema is a little bit different from the standard Italian that you're supposed to watch. Um, so this is Antonio Petrangeli's Adwa and Friends, which um, is a wonderful film about a group of prostitutes who open a restaurant out in the country, um, but they can't really escape the past, um, starring Simone Signore and Martello Mastriani. Um, and it, it doesn't avoid the brutality or truth of their lives. Um, each of them perhaps finds their own new life or different path, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean they can escape their past completely. You know, it's in the tradition of Italian comedies, but comedy is pretty much um, tragedy in brackets in Italian cinema. Yeah, um, There's always a kind of cynical kind of dark or truth to the comedy. Um, yes. Everybody pays a price in Italian comedies that nobody really gets out scot-free, <laughs> eventually. Um, it's just a wonderful film. 
I think there's another Petra Angeli in the Criterion, but again, it's another Italian director that I'm hoping Radiance might release a few more of. Yeah, is, is my uh, screen going weird there? Yes, you've got <laughs> bar at the top. Yeah, weird. Uh, so I guess it's my turn now. For... Yes. And I'll just go to what we were talking about when we're waiting, for, we're waiting a technical thing. So basically, uh, I have a double bill of two films I watched projected uh, over Christmas, which is Predator and Die Hard. And I watched them. Like, there were four key prints projected. They were great. They were. It was just so much fun to sit back and watch them and see them. You know, as they should be. You know, just they're just wonderful to watch them. So, so um, I have nothing to really say beyond. Yes, yeah, they were great. They were wonderful. Yeah. They were. I mean, exactly the films you've seen before. Just seeing them in the big screen, seeing them. The, the dynamics of the composition, seeing the stylization, how much build they have, how slow they are in the first hour as they slowly build up and build up and build up and build up. So even though you have action scenes, it then slows it down and then goes back to it and it's like just top class film action, you know, done with knowledge of you have to you have to do the characters first and then do the action. So yeah, it's so- it's almost as if McTiernan knew what he was doing. Yeah. And as I was saying off air, I got the Predator, first three Predators in 4K, which look amazing, especially Predator 2, which never even looked that good on Blu-ray, but it looks really good in 4K. Yeah, Predator and Die Hard are perfect examples of how to do it properly. Yeah, just the uh, character-based and it's just wonderful and... Uh... Even with McTiernan throwing in the taking the piss out of gun nuts. Yep. Which I don't think they even understand that. No. They don't understand it. They think it's just a cool scene. And it's like, yeah. no, he's taking Mickey. They're saying, this would not happen in reality. And yeah. then it's like, yeah, the people behind it know that. That's That was a joke. Because one of my favourite bits in it is after they've taken down the, the bad guys, um, Schwarzenegger says to Bill Duke, you know, clean this up, no traces. <laughs> and it's just like, yes, yeah, so all these men accidentally shot themselves while shaving 28 times. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's just yeah no traces that we've been here. It's just okay, yeah. So, uh, so that, that, that was my they, they were just good fun to watch. Just like, uh, it's good to re watch certain films like that every so often, just to get your yeah. faith back in how you do a proper action movie. Yeah, I'll probably have to pick up Die Hard in 4K when I. Yep. Um, just not part five. So I've been doing a um, Joseph Losey season and one of the standouts that I'd never seen before and I've now seen it I think about three times um, is King and Country, one of the five we did with Dirk Bogart, um, Leo McKern, um, Tom Courtney, just a wonderful um, World War One film. The Blu-ray really shows off the black and white cinematography based on a play, really claustrophobic. It was all done in a studio, but there's lots of mud and rain and depression. Um, Tom Courtney's on trial for cowardice. Um, and it's just wonderfully done. Again, it's a, with a lot of low say, it's really about class. Um, and it's just really beautiful. And the upgrade to Blu-ray really shows it off well. Sweet. So you did a video night earlier on year, didn't you? Yeah, this is my last, or this is the last part of Lucy I've done. Um, I'm on to... Well, didn't you cover his... that in some other way, though, earlier? Yeah, I did a random review of it first, and then yeah. I've just done it as part 15 of my Lucy or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was a really because good I, know, I, was like, I've, I've, I watched a video in that yeah. earlier on. I think it was the year before, I actually All right. did a random review of it. So. All right. Okay. I'm going to go for Walker next, which is Alex Cox's film. Released on Frank Criterion. So I got it the year before, but I watched it this year or last year. And I hadn't seen it since like the early 90s, really, I think. Or I'd seen it maybe once in uh, DVD or something like that, but it wasn't a great print or anything. But I hadn't really watched it for a long, long time. And it was just a it was just lovely print, some nice extras. It was just like a nice little subversive film that got a director blacklisted 
And uh, it's not a perfect film. You can tell he's pushing probably a bit too far in certain places. But it was he was pushing a bit of stuff that probably needs to be pushed, like the American financing of dictators in uh, South America for their own political gains and not killing them no matter what they did as long as they were following orders of a certain kind from America. And it was just like a, as I look at American imperialism and um, how it's just pretty much the same as any imperialism. It's just like, we want these people to do what we want, you know? Yeah. So um, it's a wonderful film and it's grossly underrated. Even now, even even when we're going on a bit, all of this stuff now, no one brings up this film, even though it's like the, the prime example of how you do, do this kind of film. Yeah, I really need to pick it up. I'm sure I saw it a long time ago, but it's been so long. Yeah. Um, I need to pick that criterion up. So I'm going to talk about two modern films. Wow. Unbelievable. Um, but not 2022 films. Um, Titan, which I enjoyed a whole lot more than Raw. I thought Raw was good, um, but Titan um, was almost special, um, but it's still very, very good. And Swallow, again, another modern film about a woman who has that disease, which I can't remember the name of it, or compulsion to swallow things, strangely enough. Um, household objects. Um, it's actually quite moving as she's trapped in this marriage um, and this horrible um, rich family that surround her. Um, and this is her only way of kind of feeling alive and escaping. It's actually quite a moving little film. Um, so that's two modern films that are actually yeah. very good. Yeah, I, I liked Titan, but I didn't love it. I thought it was good, but there were some problems for me with it. I've not seen Swallow, but I've got it in streaming, but I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. I have bought it, so it's just a case of getting around to watching it. Um, yeah, I'm not as high on Raw as other people are. Um, I was much, I preferred Titan to Raw. Yeah, the thing is, when I watched Titan, it just came, it really just it was in the peak of its everyone raving about it. And yeah. I think that went against it slightly because it was like, yeah, I've seen Cronenberg films, <laughs> type of thing. And it's like, well, yeah. when, it, when it came out, it was compared to Crash. Yeah, and even Vigo Mortensen said, uh, "I don't think so." <laughs> it's like, yeah, but it's yeah. it's very good. Um, yeah, as I say, I preferred it a lot more to Raw, which I thought was good, but it was nowhere near as good as kind of the hype. Yep, for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've got Wisconsin Death Trip, the next one, which is a documentary enactment of a mysterious time in the eight in the basically in. I think the 1870s or 1880s, where uh, this area in America, there's lots of suicide, deaths, and madness all in one area, this one town. And it's just like, it was just exploring it because it came from a book and it was just exploring the phenomenon. And then it goes to modern times on that, this town as well, just seeing what it's now like, which is this very vacant American town where nothing interesting happens now. And it's just a look at, um, the madness of the frontier life and also the madness within the American dream of success and how it can easily turn sour and how people are just kind of ignored once they're no longer of any use and uh, how death just becomes another statistic. And the the flashbacks are all done in black and white and to the the 1800s, so it gives us beauty to it. It's only available on DVD, it should have been upgraded by now, but it hasn't been. Uh, it's a beautiful film, and it uh, deserves a lot more attention than it's been getting. Yeah, I need to check that out. Um, I'm going to go to France in the 60s, Ooh. and Monsieur Gangster, um, which is a comedy about gangsters, strangely enough. Um, wow. Queen Aventura, Bernard Blier. Um, it's just a lot of fun um, a certain kind of humour but if you like the certain kind of humour it's an absolute blast um, and Lino Ventura I really need to get more of his films I've got a bunch of them but I really need to get more Sweet I'm going to uh, I, I've We Own This City which is a TV show like a six-parter 
all about uh, Baltimore police corruption. Uh, it was done by David Simon, who did Homicide and did um, The Wire. This is his return to policing in America. And it's just looking at the uh, cops that came up after The Wire, basically, and how some of them just used the laws and used the the weaknesses within the political system to run roughshod over the law and make a lot of money, you know, out of you, be racist to civilians, to, to treat people horribly, and knowing that they would not get caught until, of course, people started noticing their excesses. You know, so... um it's a wonderful show. Um, if you like to have the wire homicide, you should definitely watch it. It's really wonderful. There is only six episodes, so it's not like it's an epic thing. It's just a very concise look at modern policing and why there's so many problems. Yeah, I need to check that out, but I didn't have the. Was it Sky Atlantic? Yeah, or I can't remember. What it was on? Yeah, hopefully I'll get a physical media release at some point. Yeah. Steps um, off scene. Yeah. Um, back to Imprint, another one that was a lovely release of a film that I've certainly seen excerpts of a million times because it's um, in a Metallica video. Johnny Got His Gun, another World War One film. <laughs> the cheerful um, one. <laughs> yeah, the cheerful one about a soldier who gets his arms, legs, ears, nose, face. <laughs> Everything blown off apart from his torso, basically. Um but of course, was it called Stumpy? Yeah, Timothy Bottoms, um, Jason Robards, but Donald Sutherland as Jesus, bizarrely. Um, but it somehow works. Uh, the only film Dalton Trumbo um, ever directed, he obviously wrote it as well, um, based on a book that he wrote. Um, just a, another beautiful, horrible film. There's a category of film that of beautiful, horrible, and Johnny Coy's Gun is just fantastic. Sweet, that's good. Um... I'm going for another another beautiful horror film. It's called A New Leaf, which we both like. Yes. Um, I only saw this last last year. A Lane May film, uh, starting World to Matter and Lane May, about a, a guy who is trying to marry a useless wife and kill her for her money. And then he actually starts pitting her and liking her, even though he's trying not to. And he ends up having to protect her from all the people who are going to take advantage of her because she's so clueless. So it's a wonderful, bizarre film that goes in a different direction from what you expect. And it's just wonderful, just the weird dialogue and the strangeness of the whole thing. It's just a, just a great little film that you, doesn't go ever where you expect. Yeah, and it's probably one of the greatest Walter Matthau performances that nobody talks about. Yeah, because uh, he's not really playing Walter Matthau. As you know, he's playing a different kind of character, which probably freaks some people out, but there you go. Yeah. Um, next is a Belgian film by Anti Worlds. It's um, Patrick, and it's a simple tale of a um, fairly kind of inward, perhaps slow um, young man who works in nudist colony. A nudist colony, not a nudist holiday. Um, yeah. run by his mum and dad and he loses his favourite hammer it's a moving story <laughs> of nudity <laughs> and hammers in the Belgian countryside but again some of the scenes are actually quite moving when they have yeah. a nudist funeral out in the trees it's quite moving yeah I never thought I'd ever hear the words nudist funeral yes it's definitely trying to get a rise out of you oh my god <laughs> All right, uh, I'm now going to for a re release a, a animated again. It's just because I was rewatching the Batman and Superman animated series with Bruce Tim stuff. I was watching them last year, um, and I just really enjoyed it. But we'll see how well made they were and how beautifully animated and how the storytelling was simple, twenty five minutes clarity and the voice work and the atmosphere and both these. Because, uh, I mean, everyone knows about the Batman ones, but the actual Superman ones are also very good. They're very different and, you know, and they probably do Superman better. And you can't, you're most 
people have done them because it's to play it straight without making them boring. Yeah. So, so they actually uh, power him down a little bit so he's not completely invincible. So you actually have some dramatic stories. And you've got actors like Malcolm McDowell as the villains and things like that. And Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor, which really help a lot. And it's just a very enjoyable animated show. And just both of them, because they start crossing over after a while. And it's just really well done. They, they have an example in the Diabolic of people knowing what the source is and just doing it right. Yeah, I love the Batman ones. I haven't actually seen the Superman ones. So. Yeah, they're very good. Check them out as well. Um, I'm going to go with another indicator, and this is another film that kind of sums indicator up. Um, it's Bartleby, which I did a random review of, which actually got a lot of views on the channel. Um, it's just a bizarre little film about a strange little man based on like a short story by Herman Melville, who yeah. comes to work um, and just refuses to do things. He just says, I would prefer not to. And it's how other people react to that. Um, what does he mean by that? What's it? It's just, it's almost like a little philosophical discussion. I think it's only like 80 minutes long. But again, in the end, it's a lot more moving and touching than you think it will be. Um, it just has amazing performances. And it's just a very strange little film. One of the extras is actually an animated version of it. It's been filmed and staged countless times. Um, it is a fascinating, strange, upsetting little film. You were still doing that at work. But, like, I prefer yeah, not to. <laughs> yeah. I would um, like to explain it to you, but I would prefer not to. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to stick to DC for my next one. Uh, this, this will please you since you didn't like the the film where it comes from, which is Peacemaker, which is the spin-off of the, the Suicide Squad film, which I thought was a lot of fun. I like the, the film and I like this Peacemaker spin-off. They're very rough films, intentionally pulpy, but I enjoyed them. You know, you're either going to love them or hate them. There's no in-between with these ones. You're either going to get it or not get it, so... I'm just saying I really enjoyed it this year and had a lot of fun with it. That's it. There's nothing else to really see because it's not that yeah. deep, but it's just enjoyable. Yeah, but John Cena's pretty good. So, yeah. yeah. Um, this is one of the imprint box sets, the silver screens, but the standout is the Vampire's Ghost, um, which is a lovely, strange little vampire film set in Africa. But what makes it really special is it messes with the mythos of the vampire or what we have been told, basically through films, um, about what vampires are like and how to kill them. So, for example, the vampire in this film walks about in daylight. Daylight's not a thing. Um, well, that's not the, a thing in a lot of the books as well. Yeah, but from films, obviously, we've learned kind of most of our mythos from um, yes. films. And there's just lovely little touches um, and humour in the film. And it's just an odd little example of a vampire film. Sweet. That's nice. Yep. Uh, I remember you mentioned this in a video, but I still haven't got to watch it yet. Uh, my next one's a Yokai box set, which is the um, Arrow box set. Let's try to see, do I have it here? Or do I not? This, um, nope. It's can't pretty find wonderful. It. Yep, I thought I had it below me there, but it's obviously not there. Um, it's it's just great. It's but these monster movies, these monster movies from Japan, all but these the creatures called yokai, and you also get the Takeshi Miike, uh, remake sequel to the yokai films. The yokai films themselves are wonderfully bizarre and odd. If you like the Dimension films, you probably like the yokai films of that same kind of feel to them. I mean, the stories themselves are like the characters around them rather than them themselves and the humans try to deal with the myth of the yokai and how they derive with the yokai. But the yokai themselves are interesting creatures and oddball and funny and silly and they're just delightful films. I really had a blast with them. So, so they're on the Arrow releases. They're 
I've definitely worth seeing because I've because it's some wonderful things in there and it's very retro Japanese kind of monster movies. Yeah, I I, I think Miki was making a sequel to his or maybe it's made out, it. I'm it's sure out in Japan. Right. Yeah. Like Hank Hoos um, has seen it. Yes, Hoos would have seen it. Yeah. Um <laughs> so hopefully that will get a um, physical release at some point. Um so next, back to Italy, back to Criterion. This is the Torre Scola's A Special Day with Mastriani and Sophia Loren. This is a Criterion complete with special edition water damage. This is why I was able to get it from eBay for like a tenner. Um, this is a Region A. This is kind of Sophia Loren and Mastriani not being glamorous and looking like Mastriani and Sophia Loren. Um, set in Rome when Mussolini's um, in power in 1938 and Hitler's going to come for a nice little visit and a cup of tea um, and how everybody around them is like caught up in it and all excited about it and the two of them are kind of staying at home, Mastriani um, is a kind of gay recluse and Sophia Loren is a world weary housewife and the two of them just kind of connect and argue and fight and talk for a couple of hours. Um, it's lovely. <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a film now that uh, it's lovely is probably not a description anyone would ever get. It's stupid is probably more description. <laughs> but if you have a certain age of a, of a British viewership or even like in the world where there's your interest in football, you mean like this one? It's Escape to Victory, which I projected over Christmas. It's idiotic, yet so much fun. Yes. Yeah, it's like I've seen it so many times over the years, but actually, because of the projector now, I actually projected it to see it in the big screen experience. And uh, it was as glorious as you'd ever hope for, even though it, the, the film doesn't have two brain cells to work together. But all these footballers playing. Characters and not being able to act at all. It's just great fun watching a very middle aged Michael Keane run around the park as if he can actually play football is hilarious. Yes. But you get Ozzy Delius and Pelly for a bit, and you get, you know, um, the sad thing was I watched this just before Pelly died. I watched this then, but a week later he died. It was like, uh, my last thought of you before this was Escape to Victory, which was yes. probably not your greatest wish. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone is a goalkeeper, is he? Like? I know. Yes. Yeah, meeting with resistance. <laughs> yeah, and when it's the whole team, story, yeah, the whole team stays behind to beat the Nazis at football, even though they could have escaped, and then they escape anyway. It's like yes. uh, the dramatic stakes of this film are so low that they're, not, they're non-existent. And you have lots of British character actors and supporting parts picking up the paycheck. And John Houston's director picked up the paycheck. But the yeah. matter all that, it still works perfectly for a your second audience. Absolutely. Um, I did a Jodorowsky season, and one of the films I hadn't seen before um, I actually did the season was his sequel to Dance of Reality. And this is Endless Poetry, and it's almost just as good as Dance of Reality. And this is him when he was a uh, Looking back to when he was a slightly older 20-year-old in Chile, um, again, the visuals are just absolutely stunning. Um, and it's got a heart, which you could argue that perhaps not all of his films do. Um, a much more mature Jodorowsky, but Dance of Reality and Endless Poetry are a wonderful double bill. Um, again, Jodorowsky's a fairly divisive character, um, but his those last two films that he did, I he did one after that, but that was kind of more of a documentary psycho magic. Um, but these two are just absolutely lovely for visual stimulation. Yes. I've not watched it. I've gone, I haven't watched it. So, uh, Jodorowsky, I need to... Some of those things I'm kind of watching, I'm waiting to just get into the mood to watch them, because I know he's a certain yeah. kind of director. You need to be in the certain mood for him. Yes. So, I haven't really been in that. So, uh 
Nice choice. Uh, I'm going for now. I've got Nigel Neil Quatermass films and and also other viewings like um, you the Sex Olympics and things like that. I was watching a lot of them late summer. I watched Quatermass, Quatermass Two, Quatermass the Pit, the Quatermass film from the late seventies. I watched um, X the Unknown, which was a rip off of Quatermass. I watched um, The Bomb of Snowman, which Nigel Neal doing The Bomb of Snowman with Peter Cushion. I watched a whole bunch of them. They were a blast. I really enjoyed myself. They were fun British sci-fi horror at, at their best, made by someone who knows what they're doing. So yeah. it was really enjoyable. I had, a, I had a really good time watching all of these, so uh, that's why I'm bringing them up. Yeah, they're wonderful. Um, I'm going to go back to Criterion um, with a film from 1972, Bucking the Preacher with Sidney Poitier, directed by Sidney Poitier because Joseph Sargent kind of got asked to leave off the set, um, and Harry <laughs> Belafonte, for people who don't think Harry Belafonte can act, needs to check out Bucking the Preacher because he de well, he doesn't de himself, he uglifies himself with really bad teeth and long hair. Um, and he's just absolutely fantastic. He steals the film from Sidney Poitier. Um, Poitier actually does a really good job directing it. There's some nice compositions um, and shots in the film. And it kind of tells more about the truth of the black slaves that were allowed to go free, but then they were pretty much hunted down to get taken back again. Um, wonderful support by Ruby D and Cameron Mitchell playing a villain as usual. With gusto. What oh, shocking! Um, yes, yeah, it's shocking. Some really good um, special features about the relationship between Patty and Belafonte because they did fall out for a period, um, and this was kind of the first time they'd spoken to each other after a few years. Um, but it's just an absolute little gem, and it doesn't kind of gloss over, you know, the fact that Patty's character was a sergeant who actually hunted. And killed Indians, and then he has to ask them for help, so that doesn't kind of get glossed over. Um, it's just a wonderful little film and a really fun release from Criterion that I wish they'd do more of. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm going to do two films I projected that I watched this year. I'd seen them both before, but I'd never seen them on the big screen, which was Pass of Glory and The Most Dangerous Game. And I bring them up because uh, seeing them in a the small screen, seeing them in the big screen are two very different experiences. They're very, they're both great films, but we see them in the big screen, you can see why they're great films a lot more. You see detail, the sense of foreboding in both of them, the sense that things are going horribly wrong and how sad and moving Puff's glory is and how deranged Puff's uh, most dangerous game gets as it goes on. Yeah. It's like they're, they're both very kind of, it was just really exciting to watch on a big screen, just to see them like properly, rather the way they were intended, rather than just seeing on TV. It's a different experience, so that's why I'm bringing those two up. They're both great to see them. If you had a chance to see them projected, see them. They're really amazing. Yeah. Um. Next, back to Indicator. This is one of the three Region A only releases they did. Um, to some controversy. This is Orders to Kill, which is like three films into one. You could argue it might not stitch together the best, but it's just such a bizarre, um, dark film about a guy who gets sent undercover um, to kill a potential spy during World War II. Um, James Robertson, Justice, Dirks by Anthony Asquith, Eddie Albert. It's just so bizarre. Um, because it is kind of three kinds of film kind of mashed together. Um, but it's absolutely stunningly well done. Um, and again, really dark. And it's one of those 1958, um, but it does get away with some fairly transgressive dark stuff. Yep. Sweet. Um, I'm going to uh, re watching Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. Series. I hadn't watched them for a long time, and just watched them again was just amazing. Just see how how clear they were about British politics, and how clear they are about just the insanity of politics and the self serving nature of politics, and why nothing is done that helps anybody, and why it's just all about 
serving the people them serving the people who are going to make most mm-hmm. of a project. So it's really funny. It yeah. holds up really well. So it was another one. just nice to rewatch them all in one in a big run, basically. Yeah, I mean it's classic, but unfortunately it's still relevant as the day it was made. Sadly, it probably yeah. will always be. Oh yes, it's like uh, it's yeah. politics. And um, well, I'm going to go through like five films from one director, um, which was the first. Um, obviously, I seen that director. I recently did a favorite fifty kind of ranked, and he came in at number fiftieth. Even though I did forget a couple of people, so he might not be in the fiftieth. You mean yet. like Lester? Yeah, like Richard Lester. Um, yeah, yeah. It's Masamura, who I think you did the first video on Blind Beast, which yes, is that's... amazing. Yeah. Um, but also Red Angel, yeah. they're all Arrow releases. I've not watched that yet, but I've got it. Uh... Spectacularly good. Irizumi, which again is absolutely wonderful. Got that, but I haven't watched it. Giants and Toys, which is absolutely wonderful. Got that, I haven't watched it. Black Test Car and Black Report. You get two films in this one. Got both. Haven't watched them. Both are really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, again, I can't remember which one, which release it is, but there is an extra by a guy who claims to have watched pretty much all of his films. So his early work is patchy, his later work is patchy, but this kind of bunch of films and a few more, obviously, are really his best work. Um, so hopefully we'll see a couple more of these because they're all really, really good. Um, another Losi, Blind Date, with Hardy Kruger and Stanley Baker. Day of the Locust, which I don't know if... I'm not really that sure of what Babylon is about. Is that about the golden age of Hollywood? I'm yes. not actually quite sure. Yep. Well, this is probably the film it tries to be. Um, because this is just absolutely insane um, as far as stuff they I wouldn't think they'd get away with now um, Well Babylon guy... apparently is starting to say they shouldn't get away with now Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the thing is to be honest I don't really like Day of the Locust I've seen it I just never really connected with it Yeah I mean I think the ending is like almost apocalyptic it turns into a zombie film Yeah that's um, all that I liked about it was when they got really bad yeah. really horse it I just thought it was really, really good. Yeah. Um, Manila and the Claws of Light. Yeah. Alina Broca, absolutely amazing. Um, we might as well talk about Crimes of the Future. Certainly yeah. the best film from 2022 that I saw, but like I said, only saw three or four of them. Um, yeah. Just an amazing film. It's like having an old friend back. Yeah. Yeah, I was on my list as well, but I knew you were going to say it. So I thought I was leaving it off. Yeah, I think I've seen it three or four times now um, and it's just absolutely wonderful, so assured yeah. um, you know you're in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing Yeah, I've um, got the same copy, the 4K I yeah. haven't watched it yet oh, no, I've watched the film, I haven't watched the 4K of it yet Yeah and one of the, might be my favourite film from last year um, tomorrow I'll wake up and scald myself with tea um, The Czech Time travel Nazis. Um, it's the director who did the Carry XB One, um, which I thought just so funny. Um, it's one of those films that, from the opening titles, I kind of knew I was going to love. Um, it's got twins. It's got time travel. It's got Nazis. It's, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've got a few more, but I think um, we'll just bring them up and let's see them. Okay. Uh, the War Trilogy by Rossellini, especially Rome Open City, is fantastic. And really I like how you resisted. <laughs> um, Easy Living, um, written by Preston Sturgis, Ray Milland, absolutely fantastic. Dawson City, Frozen Time, about the um, gold rush, but also about cinema exe- itself and early cinema, as there's all these reels of film found in an ice rink in the 1970s. Um, Fascinating second run release. Cedomax, The Devil Strikes at Night, about a Nazi serial killer. Fantastic. Sacco yeah. and Zanzetti, another Italian film, another Volante. Well, wasn't wonderful. that in your Volante best yes. five thing? It was. Yes. It doesn't actually say much until he explodes. 
Um, the Bedford incident by Poitier, not by Poitier, starring Poitier and Richard Widmark. Um, I got, the, I, I've just got that on uh, streaming. I just bought that on yeah. streaming like three weeks ago. Absolutely wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. And um, the Karloff set, but really the strange door, the third film with Charles Lawton. And Charles Lawton is absolutely terrific in it. He is literally um, chewing the entire building and the studio. Um, but it fits in with the character, obviously. Right, and then the two films that I, had, I have seen before, but absolutely loved, but they finally got a Blu-ray, North Dallas 40 and Saves the Tiger. Um, two of my favourite films from the 70s, and it was just so wonderful that they actually got Blu-rays finally. Yeah, so we should stress that uh, North D- Dallas is better than Oliver Stone football film. Yes. I switched that off after 10 minutes. I couldn't actually watch any more of it. Yeah. Any given Sunday, it was just, I couldn't watch it. Yes. <laughs> North Dallas 40 is... I've, I've got that one in streaming. I haven't watched it yet, but I'm, I did buy it. Uh, I just need to get around to it. Yeah. So I've got a bunch of stuff... Um, like, but the, the kind of stuff I covered on my channel a lot this year, so I'm trying to avoid renting them too much. There's like the Lubitsch films we covered, which I thought were just enjoyable. Yeah. Took the Tchaikovsky films I've been doing the series on, and then Herzog films I've been doing the series on, so they were great to be watched. Chris Marker films, again, I loved watching them. Nature films we did for the channel, and Crimes yeah. of the Future. So, all that stuff, um, not a surprise if you've seen my channel. I did a, a, a crazy Bondathon over the year and watched all the Bond films. Uh, those, those are good Saturday night things for me. Um, they were fun. They were lots of fun, but what not your, really for you. <laughs> what are your favourite Bonds? Well, it's a much Secret Service. It's probably my favourite. And uh, I like the Dalton ones and the Economy ones. My, they're my favourites because they're my favourite Bonds. But yeah. I like the Craig ones. The Moore ones are good fun. The Brosnan ones are, uh, but there you go. Um, so the other ones I had to get through the Brosnan ones, they yeah. really were the chore. So there's three thousand years of longing, which was a George Miller film. I covered up my channel. It was wonderful. I recommend that to anybody. Just I got the four K from America for that one. Um, yeah, I see, it's actually under a tenner in Blu-ray. So I might actually pick up. Yeah. But it's one of those ones that's so colourful. It's, um, yeah. That's why I wanted the 4K, because it was like, I wanted to see the colours done right. Yeah. Um, those, those early Mexican horror films that you recommended to me, the uh, yeah. the Laura, Laura Rona and stuff like that, that they were really enjoyable. Um, Licorice Pizza and Ronan Double Bill I had late in the year, which were it's a great double bill, because they were so opposite as films. That's why I, why I had my list as like, just strange, strange, wonderful films. You know, uh, very different. And two films a lot I saw after I made my best of video that I liked, uh, which was Glass Onion, which is the Knives Out sequel, other one. It was silly. It was enjoyable. Some people liked some people hated it. I enjoyed it. It wasn't, wasn't amazing, but it was, you know, it was enjoyable fluff, really. And I liked the Avatar sequel, even though it's too long. It was still an enjoyable silliness. It's not not to take seriously as a film, but it was enjoyable entertainment. So that's 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 we covered everything, I think. Yeah, just as an aside, um I recently got a new mobile phone and I got three months of Disney Plus for free. So I did watch Prey, the latest yes. Predator film which I thought was all right, but instantly forgettable. Um, I watched See How They Run, um, which was pretty bad. I watched, oh, I, um, I watched that as well. I've seen that one. I quite liked yeah. it, but it wasn't amazing anyway. Which is... Yeah, it was, again, instantly forgettable. I watched The Multiverse of Madness, which I did enjoy, but I just thought it was a bit long. If it had yep. been tighter, it would have been a lot better. Um, but it was fun, but just yeah. way too oh, yeah. long. Well, like, the same thing when I see how they run, the the identity they kill was a cheat. The end of it, and it was like yeah. that that lost a lot of points. It was like that's who you were the killer. That's ridiculous. Yeah, 
Um, what was the other one? I can't even remember. But I wasn't really impressed with that either. Um, so yeah. I don't think I'll be keeping Disney Plus. No, um, I, I had it for three months once as well when I didn't really watch much because yeah. there wasn't much on. I mean, uh, if you've still got it, there'll be Ravenous on there. Yeah, that's worth checking out. Yeah, and I've still got Amsterdam to watch on my list. Um, you know, the one you talked about, David yeah. Russell. Um, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a mess, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's, it's one of those ones that's like, can I recommend to anybody? I'm not sure. It's like it's one of those yeah. ones you're either gonna like or hate it. Pretty much after ten minutes, you're gonna know. <laughs> like, yeah. but let me see Prey, which um, means I've seen all of the Predator or films. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Prey. I didn't. Like, I thought the lead character was a Disney princess type of thing, and it was yeah. annoying. It was yeah. always right, and it was like, yes. really, half of the are really yeah. bad. So it's like. Mm, if yeah. you get past that, it's suitably average. Yeah. Which is the best you can almost hope for, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really bad. I mean, uh, the f- this year was uh, for 2022 releases, uh, there wasn't that much. Honestly, I kind of enjoyed more of my older films I watched than my actually new ones. E- even like, the new ones I enjoyed, I think there's only really about seven I really, really rated. The rest were kind of I had fun with them, but they weren't astonishing. Yeah, as I said, I didn't watch hardly anything, but obviously Crimes of the Future kind of stands out, out of the yeah. two or three that I saw. Yeah. The Northman's worth watching. It's... Yeah, I'll probably pick that up at some point, because I like The Witch, and I still see The Lighthouse. That's my backlog as well. So Yeah, that was good. Yeah, there's, there, are good there are some good films. It's just uh, you have to kind of get through a lot of the trash and... Yeah. There's a lot. A lot the last last year was pretty much we'll release everything we shot that we never released for a couple of years. We'll put yeah. it out and hope the best. Yeah. Yeah. My my most painful experiences really was that we're kind of forever though. I was I was so difficult to sit through. It was so boring. Yeah, I won't be watching that. Us. Well, if you've got Disney Plus by by next yeah. month, you can you can endure it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like Angela Bassett, but you said she's got nothing to do. So yeah, no, she doesn't. She's she, she got an Oscar nomination for doing nothing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember in Strange Days, she was fantastic in Strange Days. Yeah. But actresses, they don't get much work after a while. No. I suppose she's over forty. So. Yeah, I don't know what to do with her. Instantly a mother. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh Yeah, it's been an interesting weird year. As I said, I enjoyed the other films rather than the really the modern releases mostly. They were kind of yeah. the the odd ones. And a lot of the modern releases it was based on time and nephew to see them. <laughs> so the so the their um target audience for like teenagers and things like that. So you kinda of know it's not really for you. It's nice if you can enjoy it, but it's not I'm not like in too yeah. bit of a shape of a it was not for me, really. So there you go. That was a year. 2022. Yes. Good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> really. <Absolutely. laughs> tell us tell us what your favourite films that you watched in twenty twenty two, even if they weren't from twenty twenty two in the comments. Yeah. Board. I mean it's it's probably a better yeah, you know, would you would you watch in the year rather than what was from the year? You know, um, I wish to thank um, people like uh, Chris Moran who came on to your show quite a few times over the year, really, and yeah. uh, give shout outs to other channels like Dion and uh, SGS Arts and things. Yeah, and Hoose is back, and yep, Roger so, Kirby is continuing to do good work. Yep, uh. I liked his video about his favourite um, boutique label things. I've not commented on it yet, but it's a really good video. Yes. He did a video recently on Big Time Gambling Boss. So yes. Perhaps he's the first Radiance that's been sold in the US. So Yeah, that's a very good film. I haven't done a video yeah. on that one yet. It's like, uh, I won't get around to it. It's just, um, I'm still a bit slow in my videos at the moment. Yes. Yeah. But, 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 but feel good. I've watched all all three Beverly Hills Cop movies for a video. You know, 
feel rest assured that it's coming yes. at some point. We're going to be bothered after uh, I was so demotivated by the end of it. Yes, the world awaits. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, uh, some of the things you do for your audience who would never watch it. <laughs> yeah, but they're not shooting number four. Yeah, apparently. But I'm, I'm calling it better than cop trilogy for the time it's got left before it's, yeah. that's, that title was obsolete. But um, yeah, I was uh, what can I say? January, you do strange things in January. Yes, <laughs> you know, it's all about uh, getting through. Yeah, so I mean, I, I I I done too good. I'd watched a big red one, so I had to watch some real trash after that. Yes. So yeah, it's it was it was really weird watching them because it was like, uh, well, these these would be in what the hell is this? The sequels quite easily. <laughs> yes. Anyway, we'll, we'll let we'll go now. We'll won't ramble anymore. <laughs> yes, we're looking forward to twenty twenty three, and hopefully everybody has a better year. Yeah, we're looking forward to twenty twenty three. Allegedly, I guess yes. it's a more careful uh, yes. way that will it will save us when we come back <laughs> when we do the next video for next year. And it's like, yes. oh, that was a mistake. And we're looking forward to that this year. So um, um thanks for everybody for watching. Please yeah. leave your comment below. <laughs> yeah, and they may be. Yeah, Ben. Hopefully we'll have some good videos over the year. There's quite a yeah. lot of directors we're covering. I quite, quite like to go back and do more videos on them. So I'm hoping we we'll get to that soon. It's just it's a slow start to the year for us. Yes. So um enjoy I hope you enjoyed this one. Yes. Bye. Bye.